where the the gut health stuff is headed is in it. I think this leads more into the brain conversation is around short chain fatty acids. And so we've heard for decades now, eat your vegetables, vegetables are good for you. And yeah, there's a lot of things inside of like, for instance, a cruciferous vegetable like broccoli that are are, are important for us. But one of the m- most overlooked things is it just provides the fermentable matter that your microbiome needs to to make these short chain fatty acids. And these short chain fatty acids, I think are like the future of a lot of gut healing protocols, as well as brain healing protocols. Because what we're learning is that butyrate is probably the most well-researched and most understood one. It's very anti-inflammatory. It's like probably the best molecule in the world for healing leaky gut based on the research. And we also know that essentially everywhere we look, there's either mouse studies or or human studies showing that butyrate is important for bone health, for brain health, for lung health, um, not just even keeping the microbiome and the colon healthy, which it, which it is. Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. In the last couple of years, anxiety and other mental health challenges have increased dramatically. And oftentimes the remedy for mental health challenges is either certain medications or therapy. However, there's other components within our body that can really impact the way our brain functions. And I think these areas aren't talked about enough and we're not doing enough research on how we can change these other areas within the body and how it can improve our overall mental health. What's up everyone, I'm Brian Carroll and I'm here to help people move more, eat well and be adventurous. And today I have Stephen Wright on the show to teach us all about how our guts are connected to our brains and vice versa, and how changes in one can really impact the other. So for example, some of our neurotransmitters are actually produced in the gut instead of the brain. And yet when we try to fix or help these neurotransmitters to do what they're supposed to do, we never even take a look at the gut. So with Steven, we're going to be diving into why it is these are connected in the first place and different ways to improve our overall mental health by focusing on what's going on in the gut and also what happens if you get like a concussion or something like that and how that impacts your gut as well. So Stephen Wright is a medical engineer, a Kalish Functional Medicine Institute grad, and a gut health specialist. He's spent close to 400k overcoming his own health challenges using everything from Western medicine to shamans. And Stephen is the founder of HealthyGut.com and lives over there in Boulder, Colorado. So let's dive into my conversation with Stephen. Thank you, Stephen, for coming on to the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. Of course, and I'm really excited to chat with you about the br- uh, the brain and the gut connection and how the health of one can really impact the health of the other. But before we do that, let's learn a little bit more about you and what your own health journey is like. Yeah, I mean, this could take a whole hour, but the, the short version of it is that I was born with a uh, sort of a, a birth defect called a hydrocele hernia. And so my intestines were sort of affected right from the start. I almost didn't make it. It took some anti spematic drugs at like week 12 so that I didn't um, basically die due to malnutrition. And then from there, I had a a regular Midwest upbringing until I had cystic acne in high school and a dermatologist gave me four years of antibiotics just like every every, uh, week. And so I woke up in a hospital one day, uh, basically I'd wiped out all of my gut microbiome. And from that place forward, and, and even before then, I had like IBS related issues and it, it, you know, it got worse in college. I had like a beer and pizza diet um, and then a lot of stress after uh, college to the point where I was in Chicago working for a big four accounting firm. And I basically, it didn't matter if I ate chicken and salad or beer and pizza, I would have bloating so bad that I would basically cry after every meal. And then of course, if you get that bloated, like the only relief you're going to have is farting basically. And, and, but you don't want to, cause you're at work and you know, it's really embarrassing, but I had to fart and I couldn't leave the high rise building I was in. So my coworkers ended up complaining to my boss and 
basically he said, you got to get this fixed or, you know, you have a real problem with your job here. And so that was like, I, I'm a little denser than most people. And so I need like a, a two by four to the head if you, you know, before I really wake up. And so there was a lot of warning signs prior to this that I wasn't normal, that I had issues, but I didn't really seek help until I had several of these very embarrassing uh, situations. Um, and then from there, I went to some Western doctors who basically said, you have a family history of IBS. You should take some Metamucil, eat some whole grains. Uh, you can have more antibiotics if you'd like them. You don't show the markers for celiac disease. You don't have the genetic predisposition for that. So therefore, uh, you know, you don't have that issue. Um, and that didn't really work. And so, uh, I missed a date. I was on the toilet all night and I called a buddy of mine from college, Jordan Reasoner. And he needed to go on this special diet uh, because this, the gluten-free diet for his celiac disease didn't do anything. And so he started on something called the specific carbohydrate diet and really stopped his diarrhea, his IBS, and saved his life. And so he was like, bro, you got you to gotta do this, man. You need to change your diet. And so at the time, that was a big deal to me because I didn't have any like cooking or cleaning skills. Um, and that diet, you basically didn't eat out anymore. You made everything from scratch at home to avoid all sorts of uh, ingredients that come in packaged foods. And this was also 2009. So the awareness around diet and and IBS and, and digestive conditions and brain conditions just wasn't where we are at the moment. Um, and so it was kind of like me just figuring that out with him and sort of like uh, forums and listservs back then. Um, but it, almost immediately that diet removed probably 50% of my bloating in the first week. And that triggered in me some like latent uh, power that I had maybe given over to the the modern medical uh, regime as well as just sheer rage and anger that like, holy cow, there are, there are things I can do. Like this is a solvable problem. And so my background is in electrical engineering from, from college. And so that's just solving complex problems that we don't understand. And I was like, that's it. I can reverse engineer this with enough time and money and finding people who struggled like this, I can fix each one of these. And so I tried to sort of take that anger and channel into teaching others to hopefully shorten their um, learning curves and not have to go through the same amount of pain that, I, that I've been through. Now, the modern medical model doesn't really take into account that uh, nutrition does anything for you, right? And so when your friend was telling you you should try this diet, was there a part of you that was sitting there going, what's that actually going to do for me? Nutrition probably won't do anything big. Uh, if the, you know, antibiotics and all this other stuff didn't do anything, what's nutrition going to do for me? You know, not in that moment because I was in so much pain. Um, I would have tried almost anything. Like I think for most of us who are on a, our own wellness journey, oftentimes we are served an emotional break point or in my case, several of them. And I think in those emotional points, you will, you know, almost do anything uh, to to feel better. And so at the time, I didn't care if it had been studied. I didn't care. I just, I just wanted a solution. I just wanted less pain. And so it was like, well, I've, I've failed going in this other direction. Let, let me pivot 180 degrees and try something else. Uh, I'm a big fan of that. Like not, you know, just follow the law of diminishing returns. And if you just keep banging your head in one direction, you know, statistics and math says go the other way. Yep. Um, so you said that within the first week, 50% of your symptoms uh, were resolved. Did you continue doing the diet and that resolved the rest of the symptoms or did you have to do other stuff to resolve the rest? I, I did continue the diet for, for many years and then I switched to like autoimmune paleo and then, and then just more of a, a whole food sort of uh, non-grain sort of paleo type diet. Um, it, it, no, it took me like a lot of money and everything from the craziest, most intense integrative and functional medicine protocols to Eastern medicine and shaman and, and trauma work and, and, uh, psychedelic work to, to get where I am today. Um, but what I learned right away was that certain supplements when done in the right dosages at the right times would give me immediate increases in either uh, mental clarity or stability or less digestive issues. And so, um, I, you know, I've kind of spent the last 11 or 12 years sort of seeking out those interventions for my issues and then trying to uh, help others with them. And so, yeah, it was, it was a long journey that included a lot of root cause elimination and, uh, you know, lots of supplements and lots of other cool um, interventions. <laughs> 
So you had mentioned um, that some of the, the gut connection can also impact your brain. And I know going through like your experience, you mentioned that there's a lot of trauma and all that type of stuff. So that's definitely going to take a toll on your just mental health in general. Is there um, other direct connections between the gut and the brain? Like, is there um, minus the trauma and all that type of stuff? Is there connections that if you're having gut issues, then you're more likely to have mental health issues or you might have uh, some neurotransmitters that aren't firing the way that they're supposed to, et cetera? Yeah, 10,000%. Um, so, I mean, there's, a, I think the human brain is wired for simple answers, but the the true answer is much more complex. And so there's layers to mental well-being and mental wellness, as well as gut wellness and, and all of the wellness. And so if you have a um, limiting factors, how I like to think of it, where you actually don't have, for instance, the building blocks to create neurotransmitters, like you don't have the right uh, access amino acids to actually even build neurotransmitters. It doesn't matter what you do. I mean, you can you can be doing all the trauma work you want. Um, if you can't recreate more neurotransmitters because you're not actually absorbing the amino acids from your diet, you're sort of in a deficit the whole time. And so there's a there's a huge connection between the gut and the brain. There's plenty of research studies showing that um, you're much higher to be affected by depression or anxiety if you already have a gut issue like IBS. Um, and I think most people who have been struggling with gut health issues who are aware, you know, they can typically point out that, yes, I, I tend towards depression. And, and I don't seem to see that in my other family members who don't have gut issues or I tend towards anxiety. And so there's, there's actual building block issues. Do you have the, the amino acids? There's, there's the same barrier called the, the, uh, like leaky gut or the, the gut barrier, those same proteins, zonulin, the tight junctions there, they're exactly the same proteins that get expressed or, or non-expressed in the blood-brain barrier. So what's happening in the gut is often happening in the brain. Um, we have 95% of our serotonin there. Uh, so, you know, research is still young in exactly how all that works, but there appears to be an immune system component, a, a vagal nerve uh, gut component, and then an endocrine component to sort of linking the two. Yeah, it's super interesting because you hear about a lot of people struggling with depression, anxiety, and they're going on all these medications, but no one ever talks about, except for people in like uh, our industry, but you don't really hear people talking about, uh, let's take a look at the gut. You know, if 95% of the serotonin is created in the gut, that should probably be one of the first places we look at, but it's not, at least not at the conventional med uh, the conventional approach to this and it's very unfortunate because i feel like a lot of people could get some massive benefit if they did start taking a look at their entire body and stop focusing just on my mental health challenges that we could get a lot further with recovery from this stuff yeah i, I agree and, and and this is very um this is very near and dear to my heart because I had some deep, deep depression issues when I was very sick. I also had panic attacks and come from a, a family lineage of a lot of anxiety. And so I, I've struggled with my own mental health uh, on and off pretty, pretty hardcore. Um, and so the most amazing thing is that as I've gotten better digestively, essentially my peaks and valleys of my mental well-being continue to decrease. Um and to the point now where um, I wouldn't identify with having those those issues anymore. Um, and so th I don't know. It, I agree with you a thousand percent. I mean, they, I wish people would just look at the research. Like, for instance, um, concussions are very near, like everybody's talking about traumatic brain injuries, concussions. We now know that those are a big deal. We should We should pay attention to those. There's research that shows the moment you get a concussion, your, your blood brain barrier starts to leak. And your gut barrier starts to leak. Like they're so tightly correlated. Um, I, I just wish we could get this out there uh, to everybody who's either working from one direction or the other direction, like you said. Yep, for sure. And yeah, it's it's such a bummer that even the, the medication often taken for these mental health challenges as well can cause uh, uh, gaps in the tight junctions as well of the blood brain barrier and the gut. So it's we're really not setting ourselves up for future success by the current approaches to this type of stuff. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I, I think there's significant advances, hopefully starting now in the research. Um, I think 
uh, hopefully the psychedelic revolution here is starting to open the eyes of psychiatrists as well as other uh, neuroinflammatory uh, related people to this. And so hopefully the next step will be to integrate this whole body approach to, you know, uh, gut and, and supplements and diet into the, into the fold. Now, one of the things you mentioned earlier is it can take a two by four to the side of your head before you realize that there's actually a problem, which I don't think you're alone in that. And I think a lot of people, they get so used to their own symptoms that they're experiencing that they believe that that's just a normal part of life for them. So for people that are so used to, you know, having these gut issues and not feeling well, or now it, for them, their unwell is uh, their barometer for what well feels like because they don't know of any other way. Um, how do you get them to start recognizing that, you know, you might actually have a problem and you should take a look at it and see if there's a better way to take care of this? Well, I, I hope through through shows like this, um, I, I think, th you know, hearing different ideas from different perspectives at different points in our lives when the window is open, because I don't believe that I can sort of save anybody or fix anybody. I think it has to come from inside. And so um, I, I think trying to get the message out there, like, look, uh, you know, normal human digestion allows you to eat a range of foods. You don't need to be uh, giving up something that's really important to you. Normal bowel function is, you know, one easy poop a day at a minimum. Uh, like a, there's this thing called the Bristol stool chart. You want to be like around a four. Uh, you could be slightly over or slightly under a four. Um, you know, normal humans don't have to be bloated and fart all day. They don't have uh, pain in their gut called visceral hypersensitivity. These things are not normal and your body was not designed to feel that way. And there are options and there are ways to get away from that, but you have to make health like a top three priority in your life. It has to be a top three value. And if if they can see someone like themselves or hear from someone and be sort of inspired that there might be another way, I think we can we can sort of wake people up to that and then lay out the path. But um, I do think it's a, it's an inside job. Yeah, your story kind of reminds me of um, a kid that I grew up with. Um, he had terrible gas, and he just thought it was funny, right? And then now, as we're adults, he discovered that he's got IBS and all this other stuff going on as well, which, looking back, it's like, well, yeah, it totally makes sense. <laughs> um, but, you know, especially for uh, us males who tend to find that type of stuff more funny, uh, it's it's interesting that... You go from this is super funny, ha ha ha, to eventually you get to a point where it's no longer funny and it can actually have impact on your life, your uh, work situations, etc. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, the gut gut related stuff can be very embarrassing, very uh, shameful experiences. And so we use a lot of defense mechanisms, especially as males, to to try to explain away that kind of thing. And I think in this society, we're starting to wake up to how important gut issues are and the fact that like almost everybody's suffering. <laughs> like like it's very ubiquitous out there. And so I think at least in the last five years, there's been an explosion in awareness that, hey, you don't have to suffer alone in the closet or in, in your house alone. There's a lot of other people like you who are suffering. Um, and so you know, one step, like you said, is just realizing what is normal. Because even if you come from a family history of, of farting a lot or being really stinky, you might not, you're like, hey, that's what I've always known. How would I be different? You know? Um, and so I think there is, you know, just getting the word out, having conversations like this, like that, you know, <laughs> people poop differently, people have different bathroom habits, and, and that's a good conversation to have. Yeah. So if people are feeling like they have gut issues and they go with the, the uh, diet route and they start taking out some of the stuff that can cause a lot of bloating and gas, they start feeling better. Uh, you mentioned there's some supplements also that really helped out as well. What are some uh, kind of main rocks supplements that are very beneficial for the gut? Yeah, so I, um, and I think we'll, mentioned this on and off throughout the show, but I'm a weirdo. Like I, I, I order everything from like Asia, Russia, I don't care. Like if, if it's supposed to be good, I'll try it. And that leads to a, a lot of really bad experiences and a lot of amazing experiences. And so, um, whatever the newest thing is, I'll try it on myself. I'll tell other people about it. And what I've learned is that, um, there are some underlying assumptions that 
as humans, we often make about our guts. And that is like uh, that the, the current state of your gut is capable of even doing the job it was designed to do. And, and that, those are things like, uh, is your stomach capable of producing stomach acid to break down the food? that you feed it and kill off the microbes that are coming in? Are, uh, is your small intestine able to, to secrete e- enzymes and break down the food into smaller chunks and actually absorb it? Is your, is your colon in the right condition to create the right microbiome that we're all so concerned about and taking so many probiotics and prebiotics and, and fibers and things? Um, and so I, I really have come full circle on this over the last decade. Um, I've used most of these products. I still take a, a probiotic and a prebiotic uh, daily, I rotate all the time, um, but I've I've come back to first principles, which is that if the organ can't do its an intended job, then that wild caught salmon or that grass fed steak or that organic vegetable, you're not even getting what you thought you were getting out of it, and you can you can sort of I guess you know be so fixated on you know the way the room looks and the paint and the light fixtures and making it all pretty with the fact that or failing to account for the fact that your foundation or your roof is falling apart and so um, I really like uh, kind of going organ by organ and just checking yourself because everybody has their own genetics their own epigenetics their own microbiome their own their own diet They're, they live in a different part of the world and so just rule out organ by, organ by gut organ that that organ doesn't need support. And so that's kind of what we've done at Healthy Gut now is we've sort of tried to formulate the best in the world supplements for each organ. And we'll we'll branch out in, in the coming years into really cool probiotics and prebiotics and things like that. But I wanted to go back to first principles because I feel like that's the missing piece that I'm seeing out there today. Yep. Which makes a lot of sense. You get all these uh, compounding type of supplements and sometimes people don't need certain pieces of that compound and they just need the basics. I need something for my stomach or I need something for to support my pancreas, etc. Yeah, yeah. Again, if if your organ can't do its job, like, you know, for instance, the stomach, I, I think it's the most underrated gut organ out there. I mean, it's so cool. Like it creates acid levels down to like one or 1.5, which is like lower than battery acid. Like that's crazy. And it's all inside of you. Um, it's totally contained. Um, it, it neutralizes all the bugs on your food. Um, it basically the acid levels open up protein. Um, so proteins are all these like folded messes, these crazy 3D images. And like without the stomach acid dropping down enough, the balls don't begin to open. And then if they don't open, the enzymes are just trying to attack the protein from the outside, but they can't actually get in there and cleave off the, the, the pieces of the protein. And so there's studies showing that, uh, if you have a higher acid level or you take, um, acid suppressing drugs or, or other things out there that suppress acid, like over the counter stuff, um, you're increasing the risk of food allergies because you don't cleave the protein structures down um, into small enough chunks. And the only way you can uh, get an amino acid across the, the gut barrier is in a really small amino acid structure. If it's too big, the immune system will start to tag those and say, that's, it, that's an invader. Even if it's organic chicken or, or organic broccoli, if there's a protein structure that's not the right size, it's, t- it's, it's potentially an invader. And so there's research showing that basically the right amount of stomach acid lowers these these size these missized proteins and reduce your risk of having food sensitivities. And so I think that's like just a first principle that's super cool and underappreciated about the way our bodies work. Yeah, and it's really interesting because there's so many people that are just eating uh, basically PPIs for breakfast. Like they're shutting down all acid production and they're just, you know, they don't want to feel that burn. They get heartburn or whatever it is, and they don't want to feel it. So they do everything they can to not feel it. And then you run into the issue you just mentioned, which is you're not actually breaking down, digesting your food. It's uh, going through your system at larger particle sizes than it's supposed to be. And then your body starts tagging it as an invader. And now you are got food allergies. And that's not ideal either. <laughs> nope. Nope. Yeah, and I and I can sympathize, right? I, I I had my phase of heartburn, and uh, and I never took a PPI, but I tried some of the like eating tums for breakfast for a while there. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, if you look deeper into 
uh, what's happening there. There's some really cool doctors like Dr. Jonathan Wright, Dr. Steven Sandberg Lewis. These are like pioneers in integrative and functional medicine. And when they test their heartburn and IBS patients, they find between 70 to 80% of them actually have low acid, not high acid, even though our our direct experience as a human that it, 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 it sure as heck feels like high acid when it's happening. Yep. Yeah, they're getting fermenting in, inside of their stomach, and then that gas is putting pressure upwards and pushing the what little acid they do have back out, and then it feels like they have too much. Yep. Yeah. Crazy how it all works. Well, Stephen, is there any final things that you want to make sure that we cover when it comes to uh, gut health, different ways to keep our guts nice and healthy, and how that can then translate to a healthy brain? Well, I, th- I think, th- you know, where the the gut health stuff is headed, is in it, I think this leads more into the brain conversation, is around short-chain fatty acids. And so we've heard for decades now, eat your vegetables, vegetables are good for you. And yeah, there's a lot of things inside of like, for instance, a cruciferous vegetable like broccoli that are are, are important for us. But one of the m- most overlooked things is it just provides the fermentable matter that your microbiome needs to to make these short chain fatty acids. And these short chain fatty acids, I think are like the future of a lot of gut healing protocols as well as brain healing protocols. Because what we're learning is that butyrate is probably the most well-researched and most understood one. It's very anti-inflammatory. It's like probably the best molecule in the world for healing leaky gut based on the research. And we also know that essentially everywhere we look, there's either mouse studies or or human studies showing that butyrate is important for bone health, for brain health, for lung health, um, not just even keeping the microbiome and the colon healthy, which it which it is. Um, so I think the future and where things are headed, where I want people to be thinking about is is deeper than just probiotics and deeper than fibers, even though those are important and beneficial. It's what are what is that doing and and just to summarize really quickly so people can understand if this is a new topic, which I understand it often is, basically fiber, your your probiotics, your microbiome eats fiber and poops out butyrate. That butyrate is taken up by your colon cells for energy, about 90% of it. And when it does that, it draws oxygen out of the colon, which is what we want. Without that oxygen reduction, you actually have the perfect conditions for gut dysbiosis and microbiome dysbiosis. So that one little linkage right there, if you have the wrong oxygen level, will basically guarantee that all the fiber and all the probiotics and all the other things you're doing won't work if you don't have enough butyrate. And so um, that starts a whole cascade, like I said, across various components of the body. Um, but I, I do think that's the future of, of gut healing over the next like decade. Hmm. Fascinating, fascinating. Um, so for someone that... Um isn't consuming much fiber, is that going to have a huge uh, impact on their gut microbiome? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, one of the most talked about diets out there for gut issues is called the FODMAP diet. And basically the FODMAP diet reduces the amount of fermentable matter that you're eating. So a a lot of like vegetable matter and things like that. And what they what they see in the studies around week six or week eight of the FODMAP diet, you start to lose your butyrate production and your butyrate species. And so you change the microbiome. And so this shouldn't be a shock if we go back to like seventh grade biodome, like life sciences, and you think about it, if you remove the the frogs or the mosquitoes, the the biodome, it begins to fall apart and change. There's a, everything is sort of depending on each other. And so I do, you know, I've been a big proponent of dietary change and dietary intervention. I, and I still am, but I want people to know that they need to potentially be taking things like a butyrate supplement during these changeovers to protect their microbiome. Because if you remove all the food, life can't live. That's, that's literally how basic this needs to be uh, for most people. And and that's what you're doing when you go on a carnivore diet or a, a low FODMAP diet or one of these, uh, even a specific carbohydrate diet, you, you know, you're, you're really creating your own dysbiosis over the long run if you're on the diet longer than like, say, eight weeks. Yeah. And this is one of the problems that you run into if you try to do all this stuff without having guidance too, is you can be doing stuff to your body that you don't even recognize is a problem like blocking off the food chain to your microbiome. And then 
<laughs> after a couple weeks, now your microbiome is starving and you had no idea you just did that to it. A thousand percent. Working with a with a good medical provider, whatever their expertise, if you trust them, they've helped people like you is you don't even know what they're accounting for for you, but it, it is a big deal. And unfortunately, that's partially what happens in this this world of of the internet is you know we, we don't want to spend money there because it costs a lot, but we go from diet to diet, and you're like, oh, I'm getting a little better. I love this new thing, and then you're like, oh, I got, I'm gonna switch to keto now. Oh, that didn't work. I'm gonna switch to carnivore now. Um, and unfortunately, you could be missing huge components of health because you just haven't spent the last you know four to ten years studying it like a health provider has. Yep. Yep. You might have done your quote research. But that research is a couple uh, Facebook posts that you read some stuff from some people, and that's not actual research and diving into the material and living that material for years and years and years like most professionals. Correct. Yep. Yep. Well, Stephen, what is your vision of what healthy looks like, and what are three things you do daily to reach that vision? To me, healthy is resiliency in in my life and being able to respond to to life's demands. And so I would like to be able to eat most every type of food. I don't want to eat wheat or grains on a regular basis, but if that's the only thing that's available, legumes, I'll eat it. And so being able to basically eat those things and not have digestive upset to me is is pretty healthy. Uh, And then as well as being able to respond to the stress of modern life, uh, you know, being able to stay in my zone of tolerance and, and sort of still be a emotionally available and functional adult, despite the, <laughs> the intensity that can be life. And so I think that's sort of my definition of health at the moment. Uh, what was the other question? Uh, what are three things you do daily to reach that vision? Uh, one thing is just, you know, I, I'm a big believer in our tributor next supplements and our, our enzymes and our HCL guard. So I take, I take our supplements every single day. I take, uh, extra supplements on top of that based on my, my conditions. I'm a big believer in that we might've messed up our, our environment <laughs> too much at this point to ever go back to just being able to like eat food and be healthy. Like it's just too much internet and Wi-Fi and mold in the environment and intensity out there. So I, I supplement heavily and I believe that gives me a pretty solid advantage to being healthy. Uh, and I will plan to do that the rest of my life. Um, I try to, uh, either do a gratitude journal and, or meditate every single day, just to, just to be aware that there's more outside of myself and there's connection out there and that life, you know, right now could be the best time ever. And it, and it is, if you're actually in the moment, um, so those are big, big things for me. Um, and then, uh, you know, probably just trying to be as mindful as I can around food, uh, and, and not, uh, I, I tend to overeat and emotionally eat and have some interesting things there. So I try to be healthy with my food selection. Perfect. And, uh, people can find more about your products at healthygut.com. Uh, your stop and your shop and your store is all on there. Uh, so people can go check out those products. There is a coupon code summit for wellness. Um, and that will get you, how much does that get you off? Uh, $15 off and free shipping, which ends up usually being about 25 bucks off any, Excellent. any size order. And again, that coupon code is uh, summit for wellness. And, uh, is there anywhere else that people can find you social media? I would assume. Yeah, yeah, I'm on some social platforms, but the the main stuff is on our on our website there and on our email list. Perfect. Awesome. Well, again, people can learn more about you at healthygut.com. Thank you, Stephen, for coming on and uh, sharing how the gut is connected to the brain in different ways to support both. And uh, like we mentioned, super important information, especially if you have any mental health challenges, you should uh, take a, a look at what's going on in your gut and see if helping your gut helps you mentally in any way as well. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Now, Steven and I can dive a lot deeper in how the gut and the brain are connected. And we may do that in another episode in the future and dive a lot deeper into how to take care of your gut, what different neurotransmitters are produced, etc., and how that can help your mental health challenges. But for right now, all of the show notes for this episode you can find at summitforwellness.com slash 170. And remember the coupon code Summit for Wellness can be used to get $15 off over at healthygut.com. 
and um, head on over to healthygut.com slash summit for wellness to get that discount code. Now, next week, I have Donna Burke on the show. Let's go learn who she is and what we'll be talking about. I am here with Donna Burke. Hey, Donna, what is one unique thing about you that most people don't know? I was a very highly ranked national Irish dancer as a kid. Wow. How'd you get into that? My family's Irish, so that's kind of what we do. <laughs> and what does a uh, Irish dancing look like? Is that the the tapping? It's like River Dance, Lord of the Dance. You've seen it on St. Patrick's Day, um, the Irish jig. Yep, absolutely. We traveled the world doing Irish dance. Wow, that's amazing. I've never had anyone come on and um, that was their unique thing. So that's a fresh one. I like it. My hidden talent, yes. <laughs> what will we be learning about in our interview together? That sports nutrition was never made for women, but now it is. Yep. And um, we'll definitely dive into why that's why that is, why it's different than uh, the men formulations that are out there and what you're doing differently to change that up so women get the actual support and the nutrients that they need for their bodies. And what are your favorite foods or nutrients that you think everyone should get more of in their diet? Everyone needs more vitamin D and everyone needs more magnesium. Perfect. And what are your top three health tips for anyone who wants to improve their overall wellness? One, start walking. Two, Get your blood work done and see where your baseline is. And three, supplement where your diet is lacking. So you may not have known this, but the majority of supplements out there currently available are basically made for males because a lot of the research is done on males because it's easier to research males when their hormones and their bodies aren't changing every single day of the month. Is pretty consistent for them. So it's a very interesting episode with her talking about how women's bodies change and how different nutrients are needed depending on the time of her cycle. So until then, keep climbing to the peak of your health.